Hi and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is the first day of three days of some Facebook Live fun and um, I'm going to do a mic check and a camera check and all that. So as soon as I see the stream come up for me on Facebook, I'll start checking in with you and see if everything looks and sounds the way it should. Hope everyone's doing well today. And I have to apologize if we hear some construction noise around here. I'll, uh, I'll ask them to keep it low, but um, we've got like uh, tractors and whatnot right around here, right around the studio. All right, I'm seeing the stream. Great. So here at the start, I'm going to be watching for your comments if uh, you see or hear anything off. If you can't hear me, can't see me. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. And what I want to do before we get too far into this, I want to make sure that if you are not signed up to get access to these replays later on, I definitely want you to do that. Um, because maybe even though you're here today, you can't make one of the other sessions, something like that. So I just gave you a link right there. If you haven't already done that, pop over there, put in your email address, and that way I'll get you the, the links to these replays, and you can watch them on my site anytime you want. Um, great. And hi, everybody. We've got Michigan, and Canada, and Brooklyn. This is exciting. First time on Facebook Live. Um, so, ooh, Florida as well. Um, so, if you uh, saw my email, what we're going to do this week is to look at how you can transform your playing through easy and efficient practicing. Because uh, nowadays, I have to be efficient. Um, if you read my little story in the last email, you saw that when I got my first job, I suddenly had all the time in the world. I mean, some sometimes two or three days at a time with nothing on the calendar so I could practice all day long. And, uh, you know, I, I tried doing that some of the time. Um, and <laughs> it, it didn't work so well for various reasons. Um, I mean, I suppose practicing is better than not practicing, but actually not always. And... I would just get bored because I wasn't seeing the results that I wanted. Um, so we fast forward today now with uh, three young kids in the house. I mean, my practicing has to be at very specific times. And sometimes it'll just be 20 minutes here on an orchestra break. Or maybe it's an hour if the kids are napping or something like that. Or maybe it's after all the kids go to sleep at night um, for an hour. So I've got to know what I want to get done, how to do it, and how to do it with the least effort and energy possible. And um, so that's what we're going to be looking at this whole week. And this is the first of three sessions. I thought we'd look at the Mendelssohn Concerto just as an example, and I'll, I'll throw in a few, few other things as well. Basically just the first page of the Mendelssohn Concerto. It's something that, you know, all of us are familiar with by ear, if not playing anyway. And um, it'll just be a great way to, to look at how I would work on it and how you can work on the Mendelssohn or, or any piece. Um, we're going to be pulling from also from my uh, free guide, Eight Practice Mistakes That You May Be Making. Um, those are all eight practice mistakes that I have definitely made in my life and sometimes still do make, and I have to remind myself not to. Um, that's a free guide that you can pick up on, on uh, natesviolin.com. And those ideas, we're going to turn them around. Instead of making a mistakes, we're going to talk about what you might do instead. Um, and it all starts with the right mindset. That's going to be our focus today. Um, you know, when I was sitting up in my uh, apartment in St. Paul, Minnesota, first job, and I had all the time in the world, and I wasn't making that progress, it was the first time in my life that I didn't have a teacher. You know, from age four until then, at 22, I had had a teacher, you know, violin lesson 
every week of my life. How many hundreds of lessons is that? And finally, I didn't have anybody. So I had to, um, you know, come up with my own routine myself. I wasn't getting any feedback. And I had to guess at what was going to work well and what was going to take me where I needed to go. And I kind of got locked into um, certain pathways. I thought, well, you know, I've, I know I should be practicing scales, so I'm just going to say I'm going to do half an hour of scales every day. So I'd start every day with half an hour of scales. And um, then, oh, I probably I haven't done some etudes in a while, so I've got these boxes of music that I brought with me from home. Um, I'm going to grab those and open one of those up and oh, this one looks good. I'll do that for 20 minutes and uh, okay, now I'm hungry, so I'm going to eat lunch and um, I'd better, there's nothing I have to practice, but maybe I'll practice some Bach and uh, maybe I'll practice this concerto and you know, I, I would get some good work done, but then I'd come back the next day and it seemed like I hadn't gone anywhere, like I'd taken a step back. Um, you know, I'd, I'd worked on some passage, some shift like the opening of the Mendelssohn, um, but it wasn't any better. And that was frustrating. So I didn't know if it was because I was working on it the wrong way or if I was doing the right kind of work, but just not enough of it. Maybe I needed to give it a few more days. I had no idea. Um, and after a lot of trial and error and a lot of wasted time, the turning point for me really was when I realized that I was practicing for practice I was not practicing for an eventual performance, um, for when I would actually present this music on stage for people. And um, well, I appreciate all your comments already. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to spend this time with you. So um, thanks again for being here. And I'm, I'm not seeing any comments that say you can't hear or see me, so I'm going to trust that's still okay. Um, so. What I developed was, you know, the, this framework starting with the mindset, and I call it practice makes performance because, um, you know, as we all know, practice doesn't really make perfect if perfect even exists. Um, but as soon as I started realizing that my practice needed to make my performance, that really was a big change for me. And I know that it can be for you too. That means every bow stroke. I mean, from the very first time you take the instrument out of the case, every bow you draw is leading toward that eventual performance. Now, if you're doing scales, you might say, okay, I, you know, when am I going to perform scales in uh, Carnegie Hall? But actually, I still play scales as if there were an audience there. I would like them to be, uh, I would like to be proud of how I play the scales. Um, which means great sound, all that stuff. Um, because that right mindset, it will, event, it will seep into everything that you do. And you'll find that you start demanding higher quality of yourself. And you take it a little easier on yourself as far as those short-term results. I mean, I'm also going to show you how to practice so that you can get those quick wins and get those some results right away. But you're also going to take it easy on yourself and not always be standing on your own shoulder judging everything you do. Um, so if, you know, when I open up my own eight practice mistakes guide, the very first thing I see on there is um, talking about being successful. We all want that. Um, but succeeding in your practice. And uh, what that means is that you spend almost all your practice time playing really well. And I, I know that sounds a little silly because if you were already playing well, why would you need to practice? Um, but this too was a big change for me. I used to, you know, spend most of my time actually failing. And once I would succeed, then I'd figure, okay, well now it's time for me to move on. I'll go to the next thing that I don't do very well. And I'll struggle with that. Um, so, you know, opening of this Mendelssohn concerto, you know. Mm. You know, that's what I've just done. 
is a pretty common thing that I see when I uh, pass by practice rooms, um, go by open doors. You know, I just made a bunch of sounds. None of them were the way that I want to start the Mendelssohn Concerto. Now I tried fixing things and I eventually got those two notes. Um, but again, I've, I've added a few more times. I'm not going to do it anymore because I don't want to mess up my Mendelssohn Concerto. Um, I've had a bunch of repetitions not the way that I would like to play. So when I talk about succeeding, uh, we'll get into more what that means. But it means that I want to play well every time I put the bow to the string. I've got some headphones plugged in that are making noise. Um, so what would I do instead? First of all, I make a pledge to myself, and you should do this too, starting today. If you're going to practice later today, start today, at the latest tomorrow. That every time you put the bow to the string, it's going to be with a purpose, and it's going to be a great sound. So that means no preparatory noises. You know, none of that. And that, that can already, that can be a, a, a strange change for some people to make. You may find that it's such a habit when you're practicing to do all those things um, that you may have to remind yourself 30 times that first day. But eventually you'll get used to putting the instrument up finding a note and and just that change right there what that's going to do for you is it's going to make your practice already more like a performance so that when you're standing on stage and the applause stops and it's quiet and you have to start a piece you'll be used to doing that because you've done it a thousand times in the practice room just like that preparing See how I kind of give myself a cue, almost, a breath, whatever it is. Once the instrument is ready, once my hands are ready, then I'm ready to begin without any noises in advance. So I'm, I'm curious, um, have you guys had experience with this? Is this anything you've played around with? Do you notice yourselves doing that in the practice room? and then finding it strange on stage when suddenly you can't make those noises. Because I know I, that was a strange thing for me the first few auditions I took. It felt so foreign um, to finally stand up there in the quiet and I felt like everybody was watching my every move. Um, once I got used to rehearsing those things and promising myself that every time I'd put the bow on the string it would be uh, a great sound, then auditioning was much easier. So. I see at least one yes. And I think you'll find when you take your instrument out later today to do some playing, you may find some of those noises creeping in that you'd rather not have. And once you make that promise to yourself, I promise it'll be a big change um, in your work. Um, so part of succeeding in practice um, is always making a great sound. And that's so easy to lose sight of, especially as things get more difficult technically. Um, sometimes we lose a great sound because we're actually making too much effort and, you know, we're pressing, you know, and we're, you know, it just, we're focusing on the left hand, so this kind of flies out the window. Um, what we have to do instead is make the sound the very first priority, even above intonation. Um, because in fact, intonation is part of the sound. And a lot of times uh, when I'm teaching, I'll notice someone having a lot of trouble with a passage and I'll, I'll tell them, you know, your, your right hand isn't giving your left hand a chance. Um, you probably know that, that the bow can affect the pitch, right? If I have a, a G here, if I simply use a little too much pressure, that pitch is going to go down and I'm not moving my finger. You can hear just how easily that changes. I'm not even changing my contact point. And, um, oh, I like that. Make every note a hundred dollar note. That, that's already a good saying. Um, so that sound 
has to be at the core of everything you do because good intonation won't exist without it. Um, if I jump, let's say, down to the bottom of that first page of Mendelssohn with a, a notorious place that, you know, everyone lives in fear of with these octaves. Um, what I'm going to insist is that I always play with a good ringing sound, even if I'm listening primarily for intonation. Because what I'll notice, and I see this in lessons all the time, you know, I'll, I'll say to someone, uh, can you play that a little bit under tempo? Let's, let's hear what's going on. And then immediately it may go into this kind of mode, you know. Suddenly there's, you know, not using any bow, kind of scratching at the violin a little bit as if to, to listen really carefully get rid of that. Make a real sound, make a great sound. And if it's out of tune, it's still out of tune with a real sound so that I can tell where those fingers are. There we are. And now let's talk about succeeding again because I already know, let's say, that I've played the second note out of tune. There is no chance, no chance in the world that I'm suddenly going to be able to, you know, play the whole thing in tune. But how many times do we just kind of try? You say, like, uh, let me just see if I can play it. Ah, it's out of tune. Try it again. Try, try, try. You know, if you're a Star Wars fan, there's the famous Yoda quote, right? Uh, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. And actually, uh, Nathan Milstein, the great violinist, um, I was not named after him, by the way, but Nathan Milstein said a similar thing. He's like, I, I don't understand what people mean when they say, I I'll try to do it, I'll try to play it. Uh, just either you can or you can't. Um, so let's put a positive spin on that. Yes, we're not going to try, we're going to do. Do what you can do, and then you build on it. So if I know that there's no way I'm going to be able to play a bunch of octaves like that in tune, then I'm going to focus on the things that I can play in tune, and I'm, I'm going to repeat them quite a few times. Probably more times than many of you would repeat something that you can already do. For me, this is one of the, the, those bedrock principles. I want to spend, as I said before, I want to spend almost all of my time succeeding, playing things in my practice really well, almost all the time. And so, you know, I can feel this, this builds that great hand frame one, one to four. We'll get into more uh, technical details in uh, days two and three of this training. So don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to neglect what actually happens with the hands and all of that. But just feeling that nice hand frame, hearing those in tune octaves. I repeat something, my, my rule of thumb is, I repeat something um, until I lose focus. So, uh, have you ever lost focus while practicing? <laughs> I'm sure the answer is yes. So maybe it should be like, when you practiced yesterday, was there a point where you lost focus and your mind started to wander? Um, and because I'm sure that the answer to that is yes too. When we lose focus, it's generally because we're doing something that's too easy for us, in which case, our brain has learned everything it can about it, um, and so it starts <laughs> seeking out other things to focus on. Um, or, and this is much more common, especially in for violin practice, we're doing something that's too hard for us. And somewhere in our mind, we can't fool our mind. Our mind knows that it can't succeed, that we can't succeed at what we're doing. So it sort of gives up and it checks out. We're asking too much of ourselves and so our mind is not engaged on the task. But when you ask yourself to do something that you can do, not only do you do it well and you reinforce those good habits, but your mind is engaged. So even just right now, as I'm um, playing these two notes that I know I can play, I'm getting more feedback. I, I feel more clearly the position of my one and four. I can feel the string buzzing under the fingers. It's a great feeling. 
And now I'll play one more note. Again, I'm making a real sound. I'm generous with the bow. Assuming that's going well, I'm going to repeat it now. I would guess that if I were to sit here and practice it for you right now, I would probably do it 15 or 20 times before I got bored. And then I could feel my mind wandering. I wasn't getting any new information. So I'd move on. But that's succeeding in my practice. It's building great habits. And as always, I'm making a great sound. Um, let me, uh, oh, hello, Kathy. <laughs> um, oh, hi, Stephen, too. I'm, if there are people I, I know from outside Facebook, um, that's always really cool to see you here. Um, let me pause for just a moment here and um, see if you guys have any questions or insights about what I'm talking about, which is this building the right mindset to succeed almost all the time in your practice. There are going to be setbacks, there are going to be failures sometimes, but think of it more like a session at the gym where, you know, if you're doing sets of 12, and you want, you know, maybe your idea is that you're going to not be able to complete just the last rep. Um, and people have different workout philosophies, but you're doing weights, you're going to do 12 reps, another set of 12, and then maybe on the third set you can't complete the last one. You've done 35 successes, the last one a failure or, you know, planned failure or whatever. Um, so I'm curious to see what you guys think of that. And Stephen, already you said uh, you have students make the failure, but not but not fish, not finish, is that, and um, then you're not teaching your fingers what you can do. Yes. So if you do hear something, you do something that you want to change, you identify what it is, and then you change that one thing, and then reinforce it a bunch of times. You're not trying to build on that failure, which is, let, uh, jumping to another piece, I mean, Don Juan, we've got the... <laughs> this business and you know for every one time that that run or that arpeggio is played in tune it's played out of tune where it's failed a thousand times right and myself when I first learned that practicing that was always right <laughs> uh, I would get to the point where I'd play out of tune then I'd stop and start over from the beginning that's a perfect way to build terrible habits <laughs> I'm not succeeding Good, let me see uh, what your observations have been there. Yeah, again from Stephen, breaking down the issue, separating the right and the left hand, that's perfect. That's another way to, you're basically you're changing the rules so that you can succeed. You know, if both hands aren't working together right, then you can figure out what's happening in the right hand, like for this Don Juan passage, instead of with the fingers. So. Again, I'm making a good sound. I'm being strict as far as what strings I'm on. And I'm doing it in some kind of a rhythm, but I've changed the rules. I'm not using the left hand, I'm not putting fingers down. I've slowed it down, but I'm succeeding. Same thing, I could play just with the left hand, not even a bow, and see how the hand is moving. These kind of practice techniques are what we're going to explore actually in day three as well. But what they have in common is that you're succeeding. You're doing well. Good. Practice slow and learn fast. Can't say it much better than that. Um, and I, I didn't always believe that. I thought, God, if I can't play it fast, it's just going to, it's going to take forever. If I slow everything down, I'm never going to get there. And, um, you know, I've got news. You're going to get there when you're going to get there. <laughs> um, but if you're spending all your time stumbling and failing, it will be a lot slower. And um, good. Now this is a this is an interesting comment. Perfection perfectionism equals paralysis. I have a hard time risking being wrong. And that that's a great comment. Um, and that's a great actually. You know, perfectionism is a fine trait to have as a violinist. <laughs> it means that you care, and it means that you're willing to to put in the time. Um, what I would do is to think of it a little bit more like a game. Um, 
you know, all the times that you succeed, you play something well, doesn't matter if it's up to tempo or whatever. Um, those are all, that's all money in the bank or points, points on the board, let's say. When you play something out of tune, when you fail, you know, some of those points come off the board and you've got to get them back. Now, to some people that sounds like, oh, that's terrible because then you're going to be afraid to make a mistake. Um, my, my observation has been that most people make too many mistakes in practice. They are demanding things of themselves that they can't yet do well. And so that's, that's why this whole philosophy. So rather than being afraid of being wrong, simply change your short-term expectations. Make sure that what you're asking yourself to do is built upon skills that you actually have. And then, of course, your long-term goal is to build up more skills so that you can do more things more easily. And we're going to look at that. That's actually what we're going to look at tomorrow, uh, day two. This today's mindset, tomorrow tools like scales, etudes, exercises that build those skills. Day three, the practice techniques to make good use of them. Um, let me answer a few more questions while we're paused here. Um, days that I really didn't feel like practicing, of course. Of course. And that was because I wasn't, I didn't seem to be getting anywhere. Or I didn't have, I didn't have a long-term goal that I was working toward. And that's an important part of your mindset too. That you have short-term goals, daily goals that you can manage, that you can actually achieve. But you have the long-term goal or goals that you're working toward. Practice makes performance. If you don't have that performance to look toward, then it's hard to keep that motivation. So that was part of it too. There I was, for, uh, you know, first starting a job. Of course, I had to show up to work and learn that orchestra music. But until I signed up to take another audition, I didn't have that long-term goal. Um, now, even after I had that goal of a, an upcoming audition, I still wasn't practicing with this right mindset. So I think it was maybe in my second year on the job, I just thought, you know, I'm, I need to just set up a solo performance for myself. A concerto with the local orchestra or a recital, I forget what it was now. But that helped me find this mindset. Like, hey, every, everything I do day by day is going to find its way onto the stage. And that made it more fun for me to practice. Um, yes. Sometimes being willing to make an ugly sound is better than not. Um, I'm not sure I would agree with that. Um, so I may, I may have said something unclear. I don't think you should allow yourself to make an ugly sound, you know, unless it's uh, some pieces we play, especially uh, in the orchestra these days. They insist that you make an ugly sound. But I think if we're talking about the kind of violin playing that most of us are thinking of, um, sacrifice other things to get that sound and then figure out why that sound isn't happening in conjunction with something else. Like for example, you play something slow, um, uh, first page of Mendelssohn. Or... That passage right there. Um, but then when you take it fast, what's happening? If I look in the mirror, if I'm able to be aware, or if I have someone watching me, they can say, oh, suddenly, you know, you're not using any bow. Oh, that's right. Okay, when I was practicing slow, fast, so now I've got to free up the bow, even though the fingers are moving faster. Um, so sacrifice other things, change the rules, but make that great sound. Um, and yes, keeping things positive, that's another, that's another great way to, to say what I'm thinking of. And um, yes, starting with what you can do. Practice makes permanent, yeah. Um, yeah, or at least it, <laughs> it starts to lock things in. That's why you want to do something a hundred times well. Um, good. Let me see if I can just finish some of these questions and, and I'll, I'll go on a little bit. Um, as far as vibrato, you know, I, I'm going to discuss vibrato a little bit more 
tomorrow. Um, but let me just say, vibrato is one of those things like trying to play loudly, like trying to play fast, that can introduce tension. So a lot of times something will work very well without vibrato. When the vibrato comes in, tension is introduced. And so when, when you're working on vibrato, it's important to always be mindful of what tension is there and reducing that tension. And then when you bring it into a piece to make sure that suddenly now you're not introducing the tension into the piece because that will get in the way of, of your success. Good. Oh, man, you guys have so many great observations. Um, I'm going to, okay, the very last one. Uh, Benjamin mentions, yeah, what do you do when the preparatory etude, well, you said predatory, which I kind of like that too. The preparatory etude for the piece you're working on is just as difficult as the piece. <laughs> and and that's, that's an important thing. Like I said, you want to be building on skills that you already have. So um, if the etude that, that you're working on really contains a lot of things that you can't do, <coughs> then you should probably either simplify that etude so that you're working on only one thing at a time, um, like, you know, let's say that Kreutzer II, which sounds like a basic etude. Hmm. I didn't like one of those notes. Um, this is ba basic, uh, I should say, this is the violin that made that etude famous, uh, this uh, Jack Benny violin. Uh, this is the one. It used to be that that was the most famous piece of violin music there ever was. Um, but anyway, th that etude actually contains a number of difficulties, right? You've, there are shifts in it eventually, um, string crossings, and coordination between the two hands. So one way to simplify that etude perhaps would be to slur it, because then you don't have to coordinate the two hands. So, in other words, Yes, if the etude is just as difficult as the piece, um, probably you'd better simplify it or find another way to work on and build up that skill. Uh, the only time I would make an exception for that is um, when, you can ba when you have all the skills necessary to play an etude. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, like the Schumann Scherzo, for example. A lot of people come to me with that, and it's it's a little bit out of tune, the string crossings aren't quite working, and the stroke isn't consistent. So, you know, instead of a... Uh, maybe the string crossings are a little bit sort of, you know... Well, that's, that's terrible, but um, in any case, we've got like three different difficulties to work on. So then I might send them, I'd say, you know, I, I just don't want you to practice this piece right now. <laughs> because it's far enough from ideal that you're going to be baking in some bad habits. So let's switch out to an etude and build up these skills one by one. So we're going to go to Kreitzer 8, maybe it is low. And we're eventually going to take it off the string. So let's start by playing it slowly on the string, focusing on the string crossings. get the tempo, etc. Finally, work on the stroke. And maybe you do a bunch, uh, repeat the notes, repeat the strokes to make it not quite as hectic. And eventually we get, we're able to combine all those skills into one. Now we're ready to go back to the Schumann Scherzo, and suddenly it's going to be a different animal because we've really upped the skills. Nice. So um, I mentioned short-term expectations before, and what, what should those be? Um, basically, you're looking to make one change at a time. So um, if I'm starting the Mendelssohn Concerto, First of all, I want to know that I can play the first note in tune. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to I start in second position, as, as most people do. That means a third finger. I want to know already that the second note, the first finger, the G, is going to be where it needs to be. So that's the note I'm going to find 
quietly as soon as I put the instrument up. This is different, by the way, from those preparatory noises that are a bad habit that come right before you start. This is not like that. This is a finding the note however you want to do it, quietly. And then, that's what I'm going to repeat. So my short-term expectation now is getting this thing off the ground. Again, how many times would I repeat it until I lose focus? So that may be 10 times or 20. It, uh, you know, it depends on how much new information I'm getting. Probably the next difficulty is the shift, right? Again, and we we'll go over this kind of thing a little bit more tomorrow, the, the sort of nuts and bolts, you know, how to work on a shift. Oh, I hear a tractor. Um, but suffice it to say that I want to know what finger I'm shifting on and where that finger is going to go. So my first finger is going to be my guide finger. And so that's the distance <clears throat> that I want to feel and hear with my finger, with my hand. And so that's how I would play it. Again, great sound, and I want to succeed. So I'm not going to be just, uh, you know, shooting for it. Mm. Oh, darn it, you know, I missed it. None of that. I want to know <laughs> what note I'm playing, so I'm going to listen for it. I'm going to do it at a tempo where I can... I slide up to the B and I stop when I get there. doesn't get too much easier than that. But you'd be surprised how many people just, they refuse to do it. They think, well, if it was that easy, then it's not teaching me anything. It's wrong. You're feeling the distance. You're hearing that distance just slower than you'll do it in performance. Now, what I will get stricter about as I get more comfortable with that is the timing. So as soon as I reach that B, that's when I drop the fourth finger. This I could repeat quite a few times, and that might be all I do on that for the day. That's what I mean by short-term expectations. I'm not going to say, <clears throat> okay, I've done that, now I've got to up the tempo on it, then I've got to make it so I don't hear the guide finger, um, and then I've got to make sure the vibrato is there. That, that's way too much for one day. My short-term expectation is to repeat that until I lose focus. Could be 10 times, could be 30 times, whatever it is, and then move on. I've, I've succeeded. I've made a positive change. I'm going to go on from there. Do the next shift, etc. So I'm making one change at a time. Of course, there's difficulty later in joining those things together, but that's not all going to happen in one day. I've just played that shift 30 times. Well, let's say I did it 30 times. 30 times great and zero times badly. Oh, the next day is going to feel so much better. Um, and then the long-term goals, that comes from, you know, I, I like to write things down. Um, if you, I have another free guide on my site, if you uh, search for uh, practice campaign, uh, that's my super organized way of putting all this stuff on paper, kind of keeping track of where I am one week, where I want to be the next week, where I want to be after three months or six months. So there are battles, right? Daily battles, skirmishes. But a campaign means that you have one end goal. I want to learn this piece or I want to perform this program on this date. I want to take this audition. You can never lose sight of that because practice makes performance. And so everything you do works toward that, that end goal. So for me, I have to write these things down. Um, and then it's fascinating to look back, even just to look back one or two weeks to say, wow, you know, it was just two weeks ago, I was just working on that basic shift in the beginning. I, I haven't even thought about that shift in a week because it's just been feeling good. Or, oh yeah, I remember, you know, really repeating this passage a lot slowly. Um, I see I did that three weeks ago, you know, that, that must have paid off because now it, it feels nice and easy. Um, so let me pause for a second again, and, and I'm curious to know what your, ex what your experience has been 
with those short-term goals. Um, you know, have you had times when you've gotten really frustrated and then did you adjust your expectations so that you could succeed more and did you find that that helped? Because, um, you know, I'm curious to see how many other people have, have had the, the physical sensation of, of that. Um, and yes, Denise asks approximately how long would you think is necessary to, to repeat these things like that? It sounds like you're 20 or 30 times or in one practice session. Yeah, I mean, I will repeat as much as I can before I lose focus. Because if, if I'm still focused and I'm still repeating, um, then that means I'm gathering new information, new feedback, and that's so valuable. What I find is that most people don't repeat things enough that they can do. Um, when I'm, again, when I'm walking past practice rooms, I hear a lot of repetition of things that are too, too difficult and not going very well. That gets repeated. Um, and then the brain is distracted, upset. When you repeat things that you can do, you find clearer and easier pathways. You start combining skills into chunks, and then those chunks happen so much more easily and automatically and stress-free. That becomes a foundation that you can build on. Um, so yes, 20, 30 times right at once. Um, if I think it necessary, um, now this gets into day three stuff, practice techniques. If I think that it's best to do a few sessions on that same thing, like let's say that first shift in the Mendelssohn concerto, then maybe I'll come back to it a second or a third time in the day. Um, again, it might be just for repeating the same thing. If I'm focused again, I always use my attention span as the guide. Um, and then it really just as far as weeks or months, um, you kind of see where you are day to day. If you allow yourself to play well and make a great sound, you will generally speed things up automatically because they get easier. By the way, that's one reason that um, I don't love working things up with a metronome. Um, it can be kind of a last resort practice technique if I get stuck. But the reason I don't do it is because usually then I'm, um, I'm not thinking critically. I'm just going with a click and trying to play something faster, and I'm probably ignoring the underlying cause. You know, what's the reason that it, that's not going faster? There must be some reason or combination of reasons or tension or, or something. Um, if I just simply try to play it faster, I'm ignoring whatever those reasons are. And again, I'm probably not succeeding. Um, yes. Oh, hi, Margie. <laughs> and uh, yeah, short-term goals, still too big, too high expectations. I mean, that's, that's just so human. Um, and e even with the best of intentions, you know, we know that we can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Like, we know that. We know we're not going to learn a piece in one day. Um, but we want to learn a page in one day or half a page in one day. And we want it to be in tune with a great sound, um, loud and, you know, up to tempo. And, you know, we got to go one step at a time. And we want those steps to be confident and sure because that's the, the best sign that we're going to be confident and sure on stage. Um, so I'm with you there, Margie. Um, yes. Susan says, sometimes I have trouble even identifying the problem. Um, and yeah, that's where, you know, when you reach the limits of your own knowledge and experience, um, then you've done what you can do. And that's when you've got to seek out um, that help, that feedback. That too was a big problem for me when I first started my job, this, this time I keep referring to when I'm sitting up in my apartment in St. Paul all the hours of the day stretched out before me, first time without a teacher. And I, I made a lot, you know, I could do a lot on my own. I'd been playing violin for a long time. Um, but there came a point where I needed that feedback because uh, there are always going, we all have blind spots and deaf spots. 
um, you're just never going to be able to see everything and hear everything there is to, to see and hear about your own playing. So to get that feedback, that guidance, that too is a crucial part of developing. Um, and so I'll, I'll touch on that over the next couple of days as well too. Um, one thing that, one aspect that I love working with violinists on is that problem solving. So there's identifying the problem, which, which you talk about in your comment. Um, sometimes you can identify the problem. I think often you can identify the problem or at least what doesn't sound the way you want. Um, it's just how to go about solving it. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about that on day three with the practice techniques. Um, but that's one of my favorite things. You know, that fascinates me and that's what made me want to make videos in the first place was the problem solving. How do you really get in there and take it from here to there? Um, but you're absolutely right that you have to know what the problem is first. Um, losing, a uh, comment from Julia, losing focus, a different thing than losing patience. I usually move on because I'm discouraged. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of, that's lose-lose, right? Because you got something that's frustrating you, it's not sounding good. You repeat it in a way that's basically guaranteed to fail. You do that enough times until you get so frustrated that you move on. So now what you've done is you've played it a bunch of times badly to lock in some of those bad habits. And then you move on. <laughs> um, and I don't mean to laugh because I, I mean, almost every day I either do that to a certain extent, or I can feel myself going in that direction and then I've just got to stop. You know, sometimes I just put down the violin. And it's not because I've gotten so mad that I, I just can't hold it, but I can just feel, you know, my little thermostat rising. Um, and, I, you know, I say I'm going to get a, a sparkling water from the, <laughs> from the fridge. Um, or, hey, you know, I have been going for... 40 minutes, it's time for me to read a book or, you know, watch it. Well, I don't even really watch TV now. Usually I've got to cook something for the kids or whatever it may be, something different. And then I come back um, and that's always a great thing to do. I like lots of little breaks. Um, as far as being able to deal with frustration and not stopping, that's part of the long-term preparation too. Again, if we're practicing toward performance, some of that practice eventually needs to be playing a piece through, come what may. Um, and that, that's something that many people neglect to do as well. You know, the, they start doing that really close to the performance. You've got to be doing that further back from the performance so that you can then fine tune some things that didn't go as you liked. Um, <laughs> The first 16th note passage in Prokofiev two. Yep, that's a, a doozy and one that is well well done slowly. Um, Pablo asks, say you dissect a problem to an atomic level and it still doesn't work, is it okay to move on? What are the ways to look at the problem in a different way? Well, that, you know, again, when you reach your own limit, um, I say absolutely move on. And then it could be that the next day you come back and you see something that you didn't see before. But eventually there may come a point where you, you just need help. Um, and, you know, the videos that I've put on YouTube, I know are, those are practice techniques that I know will help those who haven't encountered them before. Um, and then there's nothing better, right, than the personalized guidance um, where someone's looking exactly at what you need and giving you that solution. Um, but yeah, everybody has their limits, myself included. I, I watch videos, I read books, I talk to colleagues. I, when our soloists come through, I bug them. I'm fortunate to see, you know, the greatest um, players in the world right up close. Um, usually I, I see their back, <laughs> but uh, then I bug them and ask them questions too. Um, yes. Um, as far as Denise asks, do I like my students to play music as if they're performing and then, yeah, when, when I hear someone play, I want them to perform for me. You know, that's the, that's the best indication of how they'd perform for someone else. And, um, you know, many people get nervous in lessons. I, I know I did. Um, 
And that's actually that's great because that gives you a clue as to what the kinds of things that might happen on stage. You know, you want to there there are all these ways that I'm talking about of practicing with this this good mindset. That's a way to give yourself your best chance on stage and, and to perform with confidence. But it is so rare that you're going to do your very best playing on stage. I mean, part of being a professional is raising that bottom line, right? It's like my playing is never going to dip below this certain level. I mean, that's what my work is geared toward. I also want to raise my top line. But, you know, I, I have a standard that I always want to maintain. That's why I practice in this way. Um, but rarely do I feel like I did my absolute best at the exact moment that I really needed it. So I, I feel a little silly admitting that, but that, that's just the way it works. One thing to, one rule of thumb that uh, shows the importance of succeeding all the time in practicing is that the way you perform is, it's going to be somewhere in the average of the last hundred times that you played something. So if we're talking about that, um, you know, could be talking about anything, but etc. The last hundred times I played that passage, how did every one of those hundred times go? Well, the next time I play it is probably going to be somewhere in that range, whether that's the performance or another day of practice. So it's important that all the times you play it, maintain that standard, whether that's under tempo or whether that's, you know, whatever other rules you're changing to succeed. That's why that's so important. So you don't have to play 100% your absolute best in the performance as long as your range is up there at a high level. Um, good, and you guys have some great comments and questions. Um, I'm getting close to wrapping up today's sessions, so um, let me get to as many of these questions as I can, and then uh, we'll just, I'll let you know what's happening tomorrow, what we're going to focus on. Um, good, good, good. Yes, Christian, hi, <laughs> mentions that uh, analyzing one's own video recording can help seeing and hearing problems. Absolutely. Um, when I first started making videos, I was stunned, stunned at some things that I found. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so that's, that's a nice intermediate step between actually going and finding someone else to play for. Sometimes just you watching yourself in the mirror, or actually even better um, on a video because then it's not reversed. Um, watching yourself on a video um, will show you all kinds of things and that may get wheels turning. And I will warn you that you're not going to like what you see when you make a video of yourself. Um, I rarely do. And I'm still always struck by <laughs> how sad I look sometimes when I'm playing. Um, I'm not going to go full Andre Ryu. And, but um, yeah, I, I, I do look for a little bit more joy in my practice and my performing. That's one thing that's come of watching my own videos. Um, recommendations of etudes, technique, books, etc. to help with facility of the bow arm. That is exactly the kind of thing that we're going to talk about tomorrow on, under tools. So today was mindset. Tomorrow we've got tools. Day three we've got techniques, practice techniques. Um, and yes, I have plenty of recommendations. They're going to differ person to person. I mean, everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. That's where that personal guidance comes in. But um, yeah, there are certain etude books, collections of etudes that are so valuable for just about anyone. And I'll talk about that more tomorrow. Um, the metronome, yeah, as far as more, uh, more talk about metronome and metronome practice, that would be great for day three, the practice techniques, um, because the metronome is an incredibly valuable tool um, when it's used correctly and not when it's used as a crutch. If you want a head start on that and you haven't already read, um, I wrote an article about the rules of the metronome, my rules of the metronome. And um, that'll give you a nice head start if you haven't read that already on how I like to use the metronome. So that a quick Google search will, will give you that one. Um, hi, Anita. <laughs> um, 
one aspect, improving one aspect of one's playing at a time, for example, creating a smooth bow change while ignoring poor intonation. What is your opinion about practicing slowly enough to do everything correctly at once? Yeah, I think if there are two things that you shouldn't compromise on, it would be intonation and sound quality. Um, occasionally there will be times where it seems like you can't isolate those two. Um, the easiest way to make, well, the, the most common way to make anything easier is to slow it down. Um, there are some problems that seem not to exist when it's slow and then suddenly they come in when it's faster and that can be for various reasons of coordination. But right, um, a smooth bow change while at the same time working on intonation uh, you know, the smooth bow change you can do just on single notes or in scales. Um, going to talk much more about scales tomorrow with uh, tools, but scales are where you can isolate these things that you want to work on. And so the, the bow change could be on a single note. Or between two notes or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, you're smart to isolate that. Um, I think it could be that what you're talking about too is like, okay, now I've worked on these things, I play the piece, and suddenly only one of those things works at once. It's like if I'm thinking about the smooth bow change, then the intonation goes. Or if I'm thinking about the intonation, then I notice that the bow changes go away. Um, and, you know, that just means that things need more time to settle. They're not 100% there yet. Um, the more that you work on these things individually, the more that they do coalesce into chunks, and then the more easily those chunks go together. Um, but yes, occasionally there will be two aims. You're trying to do two things at once that seem incompatible. That can sometimes take someone else looking <laughs> to see what to do about that. Um, but that's a great question. And Soho asks, one or two principles that first come to your mind in terms of practicing that help me the most. And I would just have to say, number one, succeed at all times, and number two, great sound. Um, if you're always making a great sound and you're always playing well, even in the, the little thing that you may be repeating at the moment, then you're going to, to make progress, especially if you're building a diverse set of tools, um, which of course is what tomorrow is about. I mean. If you're only working ever on the same thing, you can get really good at that one thing while neglecting a whole bunch of other stuff. So it has to work within a, you know, some kind of a system or method. But, but yeah, those would be the two things, succeed and great sound. Um, how do you manage practice when you are far yet from making beautiful sounds in several sections of the piece, but you have to perform it up to tempo soon anyway? <laughs> That's tough. I mean, the performance deadline comes, right? I mean, when you've got something coming up, you can't change the date. At a certain point, the piece has to be ready enough, right? Um, you know, so what you're really asking is there are some passages that just don't sound good. The sound is not good when you play them up to tempo. And, you know, that just means that you're missing one or two skills that are going to help you do that. I mean, one of the clearest things I can think of is, um, let's say... Uh, in Mozart 39th Symphony, the fourth movement, um, it gets fast with lots of string crossings. So. Etc. Um, and there are many people that just aren't quite far enough along with, they don't yet have the right habits with the position of their right arm to be able to play across three strings so quickly and mixing slurred notes and separate notes. And so when they, they might be able to do it slow, when they do it up to tempo, it just, you know, the string crossings are messy and so it, it, it's a bad sound as a result. Um, and there's not much you can do if you have to perform it up to tempo by a certain date and that date is approaching soon, there's not much you can do about that. Um, you know, you hope that the, whoever's guiding you or your own plan, um, you hope that you give yourself enough lead time to build up the skills you need to play these pieces. But, you know, the reality is I've performed 
all kinds of pieces in my life where I didn't really possess the skills. <laughs> I'm laughing. If, if you ever played the Vinyowski, the Polonaise, and... that ends with, uh, with a piece of that run of tenths. And, um, you know, when I learned that piece, I hadn't been, I hadn't ever practiced tenths. So I was having to learn tenths <laughs> for that piece. And, you know, I just, I was so far from getting that thing in tempo. It was not going to happen by the performance. And unfortunately, that, that's the last bit of the piece. So that didn't sound great. But, you know, I didn't quit the violin. Sometimes these things happen. And later in life, I was able to, you know, know how to move my hand and how to change hand positions and to be able to listen for those. Th um. So that that would come out better and I wouldn't have to spend hours and hours just practicing that one passage. I had sort of tenths were a skill that were more built in. Um, great. I'm going to finish up. Wonderful. I'm so thankful to you guys for uh, spending this time with me and uh, hope to see all of you tomorrow and Wednesday as well. But as long as you have, um, you know, signed up, I'm going to see if that link is still yes i just shared the link again as long as you've given me your email there then you'll get um this replay and uh as well as tomorrow and wednesday's sessions as well i'll email you when those replays are available so that you can watch them at your leisure and i think too that uh, these videos should live on here on the nate's violin facebook page um and that way you can see also, you know, these comments and questions as they came in too. When you watch the replays, it's just going to be the video of me that you're seeing on the screen. I've tried to repeat the questions so that they'll make sense for those who couldn't catch it here on Facebook. But um, great. Thank you all so much. And again, it's uh, the next two days, same time, same place. Tomorrow we'll be focusing on the tools, building up technical tools through such things as scales, etudes, and exercises. And then Wednesday will be the practice techniques to bring all this together. All right, see you tomorrow.